<laughs> Trina said some chicken already. No, y'all want hot dogs? Okay, bye-bye. Quick I get done. Quick I start. The quick I start, quick I get done. Will you try out for like a, a TV show? Yeah, we just try out. Well, what happens is for all of them. Bye-bye. Hi everyone. Hey, how's it going? Good. How about you? Good. I apologize. I had a little connection issue going, but I got it repaired. <laughs> Not a problem. Thanks for being on with us. And now, David, do me a favor and tell me how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> Schweidel. Oh, that's easy. So David there are a lot more letters in there, but <laughs> shouldn't be too bad. Swidel. And Swidel, right? Schweidel. Wydale, got it. Hey, Miss Briggins, how are you? Good. Wait a minute. Okay, here I go. All right. I'm Thanks good. for joining us. Uh oh, I look like I'm a little stuck. Uh oh, you see, look a little froze. I think you're better now. We are. We are super excited. Monique, are you there? I am here. I'm so sorry, but I'm getting. <laughs> gathered my son is having a wild night <laughs> um, give me two seconds <laughs> okay and i'll just go through a quick housekeeping note excited to have you all on miss um, brigands you've been on with me before excited to have you attorney brigands um and david swadell i got that right right yep Professor Swadell, um, yep. really excited to have you on as well from Emory University and Monique is a strategist out of New York. Um, so we are gonna talk, have a general discussion um, about um, the upcoming election. So we're going to talk that. I mean, we're going to really talk about some of the issues, some of the things we expect. I will, of course, ask the big question um, and that probably will go to you, Attorney Briggins um, and Monique. Um, and because I know, and I'm saying that you, David, because I know um, with you being a professor of marketing, we're going to talk about some of the tools used to campaign. Um, has this campaign or this year change anything with social media because where we were four years ago versus where we are to now if things um in your opinion professional opinion doesn't seem as aggressive not as aggressive seems to be a different tactic for me that's just from the journalistic standpoint mm -hmm. but i want you as an expert um to talk about that and maybe we can see which side has been more active as well if we know that if that data is out there as well um attorney briggins want to ask um will we probably of course have the um results tomorrow. If not, what does that mean? Um, legally, what does that mean? Um, or is it something we should be expecting, really, um, as Americans, that it may not be determined tomorrow? But of course, I think there's an anxiousness, if you will, for many Americans, regardless of what side you're on, to know those results um, tomorrow night. Yeah. So, um, Shana, before we get started, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, I'm I'm gonna try to come out and come back in. Okay, I'm I'm stalled or something. Something. Yeah, weird. I can hear you fine, but you seem like it's the the motion is delayed from the voice. Yeah. So, or because you're recording this, right? I am. I'm I'm recording it, but of course, it's streaming live on Facebook. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's get that straight. Okay, because right they will be seeing us. In. Yes, it's a visual. Okay. And Monique, right, I'm not right. sure if you can hear us. I know you're with your son, but. We um, obviously as a strategist, we'll talk about some of the um, trends and some of the behaviors going on with both sides, the Republican and Democratic side um, as well and what that means for future elections. Um, and David, it'd be interesting to say for future elections as well because the, the social media, that's huge. I mean, it's, it, it seems to be really, when I say social media, obviously I'm including YouTube. I mean, my kids, oh. my boys are both in elementary school and they're watching Lego YouTube or building do-it-yourself projects for kids and every other minute it's and I'm not just talking about presidential the senatorial races mm -hmm. and I'm like but 
they're eight and five. They can't vote. <laughs> <laughs> no, Shana, you're based out here, based out of Atlanta. Yeah, I'm Atlanta. Yes. Okay. So, so you can imagine my eight-year-old and five-year-old. They've come to recognize John Ossoff and David okay. Perdue. <laughs> More so than President Trump and Joe Biden. They have. <laughs> And what are they watching on YouTube? So my kids are watching Legos, building Lego sets, right? Okay. They're, watching, they're watching gaming videos. And when I say gaming, I'm talking about for 10 and 11 year olds, not grown men playing, right? Okay. Or, yep. like this. They're watching that. They're watching do-it-yourself kids that build projects. Because my boys are yep. into building, like, you know, building wood projects. And you have the dads working with the kids on it. And these commercials are popping up. And I'm like, why would you, I, I guess they're assuming, and that's right, my husband and I are somewhere in the background. Is that for us or is that just marketing galore? They're just pouring out those commercials without realizing. I think that I think that's more of what it is, is you're just seeing, and you know, I used to live in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, which were battleground states. And if you live there, you come to expect it. I don't think we've come to expect it yet in Georgia, but I think we should going forward. I see. So you, I mean, it, it, was it is just, it's just carpet bombing. And that's what it is. I mean, and, and I tell you this, they have trained a generation of children. <laughs> I mean, <regularly. laughs> to the fact where my eight-year-old can tell you the John Ossoff and David Perdue commercials by hard. And I'm like, that is scary. <laughs> well, let's, let's look at the positive. They're, they're we're teaching civic engagement <laughs> from a young age. Correct. They are. But but look, you know, this is being um, in marketing, but either you're turning them on or you're turning them off from politics that early. Mm -hmm. It's one of the two. <laughs> well, to, you know, I was watching West Wing today. I, there, yeah. I had recorded a rerun on YouTube TV. Oh, so not, not the new one on HBO that came out. Now, I haven't seen the new okay. one yet. So this, this was a rerun. I think it was airing on TNT. Okay. Okay. Um, but I was watching it on YouTube TV and you would think, okay, well, it's YouTube, so it's Google, yes, that we yes. can do a pretty good job with ad targeting. I was a little surprised to see an anti-Biden ad in West Wing. Well, um, it, it, they, they, it tends to be back to back what I've noticed. And it's yep. like, you'll see a Trump, Biden, Biden, yep. Trump. I mean, or it's- Purdue Ossoff ads we're seeing, or Warnock and, or, and right. Leffler. Kelly Leffler. Um, yep. I, I see mostly Warnock and Kelly Leffler more than I see Doug Collins. I've, lately <laughs> in the last week, I've seen more of his, but I haven't I've seen, seen some of much. Collins and Leffler back to back. Yes, yes, but not, correct. And it looks like, and you probably, they're saying that's probably gonna be a runoff. That's what it's looking like, unless War I mean, you know, the last I saw was Warnock had a chance, but it wasn't looking likely that he was right. going to get the majority. Because it's such a crowded race. Yeah. It's a very crowded race. I think, you know, we obviously see the big names, but I think there aren't like 25 other people running on that ballot. Yeah, I think 30, I think it was 31 names on the ballot. <laughs> I tickled a little because Atlanta Press Club, I watched their senatorial debate and I was laughing because all the top names were um were they skipped it didn't they huh didn't they skip it well they played it but i i'll be honest i i didn't stay for the second part <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <They were> like, <laughs> I, i've seen the top contenders i'm good <laughs> they did they, it, it was coming on immediately following because i watched the replay that came on that night on facebook okay mm -hmm. uh and monique i have two for you just just ending one right now. Okay, got it. And maybe you <laughs> Great. Back on with this? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, and I do want to let you all- Oh, no, no, that was me. That was me talking. That was Monique okay, talking. I Sorry oh, about I that. You. There you are. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. You know what? It's. It, I've had like some unexpected surprises <laughs> approaching seven o'clock, that, so- That's all right. Hey, life happens. <laughs> and we'll get started shortly. Just a quick housekeeping note. I'm sure many of you are-, are familiar with virtual events. Um, but if you, for some reason, someone comes in, a partner, spouse, your kid, your dog, happens to come in and starts barking or your cat meowing really loud, um, I would ask, you get that over there. I would ask that you um, kindly mute your line for us. And it's probably, do you see the water dropping on the floor? 
Thank you. It's probably best if, um, and I will call on you. So it's not a free for all. I will say, you know, uh, Professor uh, Swadell, I will say, uh, Ms. Charles, and, and how do you pronounce your last name? Charlton. Char Charlton, thank you. Yeah. Um, I will specifically call on you so you'll know um, that you're not talking over each other. So if you wanna keep your mic muted until I'm called on you, that would probably be helpful. It's just so there's no background noise and there's no echo if someone walks in listening to the show as well. And if you have to excuse yourself for the restroom, of course you can. I just ask, I don't like to see an empty seat. If you would just um, cut off your camera momentarily, you don't have to announce it or anything. You can put something in the private chat. I'll be able to see it as well. But if you'll just come right back on as soon as possible. And once I see your camera disappears, I know you have to take care of something. So I probably will skip you for that round of questioning, okay? Were there any questions for me? Shana, Shana um, I'm gonna just do it from my phone. I don't know. That, are you on your phone? Uh-huh. That looks that good. Uh -huh. Yeah, that yeah, looks that looks good. You're, it's not a delay. Not a delay. Not a okay. Not a oh, oh, I see. You have another one on. Wait, I'm going to turn that one off. Okay. That one just. Oh, oh, hold on. Wait a minute. Okay, I'm having a difficult time. Okay, Uh-oh, it's still on. I'm, I'm trying to turn it off. Uh-oh, but... okay. <laughs> Girl. Girl. Wait, 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 wait. And I'm going to go ahead and, and go ahead and stream us over. Um, but were there any questions for me for housekeeping before I connect this to Facebook Live? And it will be streamed at at LTA Radio. So just for Let's Talk America Radio, the acronym LTA Radio. No questions? Okay. And Monique, you went, I don't see you. She must have said her name. Where's my... Um... All right, yeah, that looks good. That's clear too. Perfect. I'm just, Were there I'm any just to have a steady hand? So okay. <laughs> see it wobbling. I'm holding and a strong hand with muscles too, because that's. <laughs> Were there any questions for me, David or Rhonda? Did you all have any? No, I think no, I'm good. Think I'm good, also. Good. And I will, let me ask you, what, what do you prefer to be called? David, do you want Professor Swadell? What do you want me to refer you as I ask questions? Um, David is fine. Are you okay? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, if, you, uh, you know, if you're doing introductions at the start of that, I'm a prof you know, Professor Swadell from Emory, but then David's fine after okay. that. Sounds good. And Rhonda, uh, as well as Attorney Briggins, what's comfortable for you? Um, actually, just call me Rhonda. You don't have okay. to call me no attorney anything, just Rhonda. Okay. <laughs> you all are a casual group. I love it. <laughs> and Monique? When I'm gonna go ahead and connect us over to Facebook. So we'll have a few seconds. When you all, because I won't be able to see her when she comes on, please let me know when she comes back on so I know to go ahead and stream it so we can see her live. Thank you. And so I'll be able to hear you.
Now my camera seems to be frozen. Can you see me? No, we cannot. No. All right. I had the same issue. I end up just getting on my phone. I'm gonna leave and come right back. Shana, have you started um, doing going live? Not yet. I'm in the, it's about a few seconds, but I, I don't did hear her. She said she was gonna come right back on, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm gonna do a little housekeeping thing too while she's going there. I think I can probably. Okay, all right, this might work. Let's see if I can get this. Okay, she's coming back in now. Ready, Rhonda? Okay, one second. I think we're ready. Let's see if that works. Hi. Hey, there you are, Monique. Hey. Hey, there we go. Yes. Is that better? Yes. My hair certainly looks better. <laughs> <laughs> and it just. Rhonda, that for some reason, okay, it's giving you. Okay. It's doing some funk in it. Yeah, it okay. was doing some. Okay. All right. What about now? It's good. Yes, perfect. Okay, we're about to go in. I got a text. Somebody said, we were waiting to see you all. <laughs> oh, we done had some, some technical difficulties tonight. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I guess these phones and computers are finally saying, look, it's enough. <laughs> enough Zoom. They're all going crazy. <laughs> all right, I'm ready. All right. And we are live now. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Real Talk presented by Let's Talk America Radio. I'm Shana Thornton. I'm on air host and I'm also executive producer and super excited and grateful that you've joined us for this big night. It is Monday. It's November the 2nd. And many of you know, it is the eve of the upcoming election. So much at stake. There's a presidential election, one that will be in the books for many years to come. There are also some key Senate races, not just here in Georgia, but throughout the nation. This really will be a test of America's place in history. No matter where you side politically, I think you're going to gain something from this show as we have an awesome, awesome panel that is going to share the expertise and some of their feedback for you. So let's go right in for us. First and foremost, I want to introduce you to the panel and I have the one and only Professor David Swidell with us. He's a professor of marketing from Emory University. Welcome to the program, Professor. Thanks a lot, Shana. Super excited to have you on. Also, we have with us attorney at law, Rhonda Briggins with us. Rhonda, welcome to the program. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shana. 
Thank you. Also, uh, she's an advocate in the community for some social issues and a part of some key organizations. And last but certainly not least, we have Monique Charlton with us. She is a political strategist out of New York. Monique, welcome to the program. And you're muted. Whoops. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Shana. Thank you for being on with us. So everyone, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that we have a diverse group with us, but the right ones, we seek the best and the brightest. And I want to go ahead and open up. There's so much at stake. Uh, the chatter online, the chatter in person um, at the office, even with our mask on due to COVID, is about the upcoming election. Professor David, I, I want to shoot my first question to you because we cannot talk about anything really, but especially the election without bringing up social media. The marketing of it, right? I, I believe many of us can recall on this panel when we were little kids, it was the commercials that seemed to air on television, those major stations. And now so many of us, obviously, we're watching, um, if it's YouTube, if it's Facebook, if it's Instagram, we've seen the commercials, we've seen the still shots. Um, David, has this election cycle, has it changed any from four years ago? Because as you know, four years ago was in the books on its own for marketing and trends and things that were happening and allegations and accusations with some foreign influence as well. Anything unique here now where we are in 2020? Well, I mean, let's remember that for, this is all about marketing. You know, so whether we're selling you toothpaste and soda or we're selling you politicians, yeah, th this is a very simil similar playbook and we're going to follow the eyeballs. And there were reports coming out of the 2016 election that you had um, tech company executives saying that Donald Trump ran the best digital campaign the, they had ever seen. Wow. Not the best political campaign, flat out the best digital campaign they had ever seen. And that was kind of the expectation coming into 2020 again. I think on the Democratic side, they caught back up a little bit. You know, I was just looking at Facebook's ad library. They're making uh, more information about the political ads available be because of the foreign interference that we had in 2016. And one of the surprising things in this cycle is Joe Biden's outspent Donald Trump on Facebook. Wow. Uh, yeah, so at, yeah, looking at the last week, uh, Joe Biden spent $4 million. Donald Trump spent $4.5 million. Yeah, if we go back over the course of the entire election season, we still see a gap between Trump and Biden. Uh, so that's one thing that, that we're seeing is yeah. different. Um, the other thing that I was a little bit surprised about this, but I looked at it a couple of days ago, um, where they're spending that money. Okay. You, know, you think that you're going to see that kind of spending in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, your typical battleground states. But one of the things we've seen this election, and I think the polling numbers um, kind of align with this, is there are more states that are in play. You know, so we're seeing a lot being spent on Texas, be, being here in Atlanta. We're seeing a lot more being spent in, on the Georgia race. I think uh, Kamala Harris was down here. I think uh, President Obama was down here. So all of these are signals that Georgia's in play now where go back four years ago, I don't, rem I don't recall the margin that Trump carried the state by, but it, it was not close. No, um, no. I, I want to ask you something before we move on about um, online marketing, if you will. And we bring up Facebook and Instagram and, and obviously you're an expert at it as a journalist background. I have some familiarity, not quite like you being a, a marketing professor at Emory University, but there's an algorithm that's in play. Many people know when it comes to Facebook and Instagram. And you said that Vice President Biden has outspent President Trump in terms of cash dollars or what's been spent on social media. But that does that necessarily mean that it's reaching more people? Because, right, I, I, I'm assuming that the algorithm for Facebook and Instagram is set up to say, if I tend to have more progressive liberal ideologies, they're probably going to market more of Biden and Harris versus a Trump and Pence. Is that true? Or when it comes to this type of market, it's more of a free for all. You're absolutely right that, you know, based on your inclinations, based on the things that you've tended to look at, based on the content you've read, based on your connections, the organic reach, the posts that they're not paying for, are go you know, you're going to get a more liberal slant or more conservative slant, depending on um, on your leanings. And, you know, looking at the number of likes on Biden and Trump's pages, you know, Trump has 30 million likes, Biden has three and a half million. So there's a big difference there in terms of that organic reach, but that's telling us what they're going to get without spending a dollar. Okay. When it comes to the advertising, they're paying for what they're getting. 
I see. Great point. And we're going to talk more about what's going on online. But I want to turn my sights to you, Attorney Briggins. Um, obviously, you have um, an, a wealth of experience when it comes to politics and law. Um, is it surprising to you that a, a, a state like Georgia now is being talked about as a possible swing state? Because as we know, traditionally, Georgia was never considered that. Is this a surprise to you? And if not, or if so, how come? Well, no, I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, if you look at um, Stacey Abrams and what she has done around this country, um, we're now in play. We're, the blue wave is coming. Um, you know, she's been saying it was coming and no one predicted it to come this fast except for the folks that are on the ground because they know that folks have been organizing like they've never done before. And so I just think with, with everything that's going on, the community understand what's at stake. Um, Southern states have always band together a little differently um, than, than other places. So we, we, we have a whole lot of stuff going on. You know, this year in the state of Georgia, we, we saw the, the death of Ahmaud Aubrey play out in front of us. Um, that caused and stirred up stuff in all of us that, that we'll, we will never forget. Um, immediately after that was George Floyd, and then the list goes on and on and on. And we've had two incidents in Georgia, where we saw um, police brutality in our face and people dying on, on national television. And so I think a combination of all of that has not only brought people to the streets, but allowed people to organize and understand the importance and our attachment to that history being in the South. So I, I don't see this blue wave of being a shock and a surprise to many folks. I just know it's time, we're ready, and wait till the, uh, the, the, the tides come in on tomorrow. Wow, so I mean, it's gonna be interesting. You did mention that this has been um, in the making, you believe, for a while. Um, and for those that are not as politically savvy as you and our panel of guests, when you say it's been in the making and there's been movement on the ground, what are you specifically talking about? Are you talking about, Rhonda, more of grassroots efforts? Is it Correct. recruiting new voters? What, what's all included in the efforts that um, the Democrats have done? And also, I'm going to guess, and let me know if I'm right or wrong, the Republicans have also done? Yes. So, so you, you know, um, every since again, uh, uh, when you look at 2016, um, our polls opened, um, what now two weeks ago okay. and less than four days of the polls opening in the state of Georgia, we had over a million voters already voting. And that's not on top of the 800,000 that we had with absentee ballots already in. And so, you from from all of the voter registration efforts going on with all of the different organizations people have been on the ground organizing and making sure that in georgia we increase all of the voter participation on all levels that we had we were registering folks to vote that we were going back and not only registering those folks but encouraging them to get to the polls early i'm um, looking at the the absentee ballots for all of those seniors and different folks because of COVID that we know um, has a participancy of not going actually to the polls on November the 3rd to make sure that they were getting their votes in early. Um, we understand everything that was going on to do voter suppression. So the whole election protection coalition and galvanizing of all of the different organizations working together. Um, for me, I've been working with a lot of these organizations. I have never seen this level of collaboration, cooperation and intensity like I've seen you know, everyone now is like, what is this thing, the D9? Well, those organizations have been around over 100 years. And so, and we understand, and many of us, our very, very first act was participation in, in, in the right to vote. And so with that, you have seen organizations that have been in, in the background of this culture, these communities forever, the Masons, the Eastern Stars, I mean, all sorts of organizations. They have come together and they've collaborated They've gotten out the vote and you will see the results on tomorrow. You know, Monique, and obviously you're out of New York. I know uh, David and Rhonda are out of uh, Georgia um, for the most part. Rhonda talked about millions of new voters being registered, right? Now, obviously throughout the country. Uh, is that good for Republicans or Democrats? And how do you think that will impact tomorrow's results when we talk about presidential politics? Mm -hmm. So the Democratic group has definitely, especially as we saw in the last election, motivation to participate. Um, and that's in a number of elections that we talked about. If you think back to Obama, um, when everybody and their literally 
you know, <laughs> were at the they voted. It was because we were uh, that was in the community. Um, and people mobilized, people really mobilized. In 2016, I don't think people were excited. I don't think people um, thought that Donald Trump would win. I see. Um, and that's in the Democratic Party that I'm talking about. Um, and so there wasn't an activation, it wasn't a mobilization of um, people out. Um, a lot of people <laughs> were shocked. Um, which happened on my birthday. <laughs> it was a very um, disappointing birthday. But um, yes, so uh, it, here in New York, um, it's good for the Democrats. It's good for the Democrats that um, people are going to vote. And it's definitely a Democratic effort that everywhere I an hour from the dem from various Democratic groups and um, various candidates and supporters. Um, I get text messages like, um, it's definitely a to get out the vote. To start updating people on on um, where polling are, and it's definitely for both parties. It's for both parties, um, but we know that for two. And there is a counter effort when a person's voice is heard on day tomorrow. Um, with that being said, though, Monique, um, obviously, I'm, I'm imagining that so many of the millions of new voters are younger voters, right? That's Absolutely. typically what I'm going to think. And I think there's a notion or belief that younger um, Americans tend to be more uh, Democratic based in their thoughts. At least that was, I think, you know, an old way of thinking. Not sure it's still like that. It probably very much will be. Um, but with that being as well, I've also spoken with other strategists and experts who've been at this uh, political game, if you will, or seen for a very long time that have also said, and, and, and please, for no uh, millennials or alphas or Zs to, to come at me, but have said mm -hmm. those also are the group of voters that can be the least reliable in terms of showing up at the polls. Um, does that concern you? I mean, because there, there seems, I have seen this, there is rhetoric out there online um, where people have, it seems to be targeting younger voters of saying, does it really matter if you vote? You can't trust it. There's something with the mail system. These, these are, uh, if you will, statements that are coming out that I am assuming are trying to influence certain voters to not show up. How do you see that playing into tomorrow? Mm -hmm. So I think in the past, um, and, and largely have felt affected their lives, but I'm going to say that due to COVID in particular, um, everyone was home and we're all watching. And I don't know if you um, are active on social media, but it really was this generation, this, the millennials and Gen Z that were active, really active and mobile and protesting. Standing up to as you know, they're standing up to their family and um, for principles that really are vanity. And so I think that generation they have had the time to absorb social issues and political issues and made time that they didn't have before. Right? We don't have they've had before. Um, now there uh, many are hired to care more, and I do think that. They are really seeing this voter register um, um, surge that we've seen recently. I see. Now yeah, that's that's interesting to note. Um, and thank you for your information. I want to go back to you, David, um, professor of marketing at Emory University out of Atlanta. Um, we talked about the millions being registered, and a lot of those assuming are younger people. Um, but you shared an interesting fact, obviously, that um, both political sides, and we do recognize there were independents in the race, and I certainly want to recognize that along with the Green Party, Libertarian Party um, as well. But Obviously, we do know that a uh, majority of the votes in the United States tomorrow will be cast by those who will be casting a vote for the Democratic Party or for the Republican Party. So with that being said, when it comes to social media, should we expect more of an impact to be on a younger generation or not necessarily? Typically, that's what we expect is that social media, when you look at it, does tend to skew younger. I mean, I think if you look back, it, this is a couple of election cycles now, but if we relied solely on what we saw on social media, Ron Paul would be president. 
Uh, and so that's, you don't always get that alignment between what you're seeing in terms of the volume or the sentiment on social media and what actually becomes um, the ballots that are being cast. Uh, I think, you know, the other thing that makes reading the tea leaves difficult when, with social media is you have to keep in mind, Shana, you mentioned the, the algorithms earlier. Um, those algorithms dictate a lot of what we're exposed to. And so, yeah, keep in mind that social media platforms, at the end of the day, their goal is to keep you on the website, right? Yeah, they're not democratic or conservative. They're in the business of making money and they do that by keeping you on the website and serving you more ads. And so what they tend to do is uh, serve you content that they know is going to resonate with you, which means if you lean conservative, we're going to give you more conservative content. If you lean liberal, we give you more liberal content. And what that does is you, it reinforces the echo chambers that we all live in already. And so for the, you know, the, for the younger voters, um, if, yeah, if there's a particular uh, political skew that they have, it's going to reinforce uh, those pre-existing beliefs that they have. Wow. I, I want to talk about the E word of extremity <laughs> because I noticed, David, that, uh, and you know this, I think this can be life in general for the people that may be satisfied or had no problem with anything. An experience at a restaurant, they don't seem to complain as much. I'm going to translate mm -hmm. that into politics now, right? Um, and you remember four years ago, the term silent majority kept being mentioned and tossed around. People that don't necessarily go on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or Twitter to express their ideas, right? They're on there to look, maybe they have reservations, maybe they were raised that, well, politically, you don't share your ideas. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they work for a job or they're in a profession where they don't feel quite as comfortable doing that. But we all know tomorrow, right? How they vote is how they vote. We don't know. I mean, someone could say one thing on social media, but vote very different. Um, the extremity of it seems to me, especially politically, has gotten more to the 10th level as time has gotten on, where I have witnessed um, what seems to be virtual arguments and yelling that have turned personal, unfortunately, of, yeah. of name calling things outside of the element. And, and I'm thinking, obviously, there are ideologies that go with it um, that people hold true to their heart and their brain as they should, right? I mean, this is United States, it's a democracy, and you can have your opinions. But I, I guess to call people names and to, to cuss them out and use these words based off of, let's be fair, men or women that are running nine out of 10, they don't know, seems very interesting to me. And, and I, I spoke to um, a psychiatrist who was on our show previously that said some of it seems emotionally unstable sometimes because people are getting very heated about these things. Um, do you see that as someone that's an expert in marketing as a reflection of the pulse of our society? Or David, it's just social media. Should we just take it for what it's worth? I mean, as a parent, that always concerns me when I see these type of behaviors. Obviously my children are not on social media yet, but I'm wondering, is that a reflection of who we are? It's almost goes into the old question about art. Is it a reflection of society or society a reflection of which is it? Well, one of the things you've got to keep in mind with social media is it gives people a veil that they're behind. Yeah. You know, in, in some cases, you know, we don't not so much on Facebook where your name is actually on it, but there are going to be dark corners of the internet where you're virtually anonymous. Yes, and so we see people acting differently than they would if they were talking face to face with someone. So I think that ability to kind of separate yourself from what you're saying. Um, digitally, I think that's part of what we're going to see with the, with this extremity. Um, one of the things we have observed uh, with online behavior, you hit the nail on the head when it came, when it comes to the silent majority. The people that we hear from, whether it's politics yeah. or buying a new product or right. going to a restaurant, yes. it's people that had an extreme experience. You either right. loved it or you hated it. Mm -hmm. If you said, "Eh, it's okay." there's not really anything for you to share. So it's usually the people who have a particularly charged opinion on the matter who are going to be vocal on social media, uh, who are going to kind of be um, engaging in those discussions. But I think, again, this goes beyond politics. I you know, we've had uh, news publications have to shut down their comment section uh, yeah. because of the comments that were being posted just kind of the the level that discourse sank to. I mean, I tell my students when we're talking about online conversations that it really does devolve into a cesspool. Yeah. 
uh, th and there's no there's no way to get away from that. And so, even if it's just started as political ideologies that we have, there's something about that kind of online discourse that people kind of feel free to kind of stoop lower than they otherwise would. Now, yeah. I will say, yeah, you know, just looking at the news recently, how we have, you know, caravans of vehicles blocking buses and blocking traffic. I'm not sure if that's solely restricted to online behavior anymore. It yeah. seems like it's spilling over a little bit um, into how people are acting in society. Yeah, yeah. And that I think that's the part that should be concerning. Um, if not, now we're translating it. And I guess it goes back to what our moms and dads told us when we were young. You're around something long enough, you will certainly start picking up those behaviors. Rhonda, I want to go to you, attorney at law, um, obviously an advocate in the community um, throughout the country, very familiar with political um, scenes as well. Tomorrow, so many people um, will be up late watching whatever. It's Fox News, CNN, ABC, CBS, who's going to be president of the United States. But I have to ask this, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, there are key Senate races that are happening right now or in Georgia, throughout the country. Is there an assumption, and, and, and I'm, I'm not as savvy at politics as you are, but is it a fair assumption to say, if there's a sweep tomorrow, either way, by President Trump or Vice President Biden, can we expect the fallout to be the same for the Senate races or congressional races or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, you know, we it is it is our hope that people are voting up and down the ballot, but um, you know, statistics has shown in the past that is not always the case. And so, um, you know, unless people are going in doing straight tickets, um, we'll see. Um, I, I we we've been pushing <laughs> to make sure that people are voting up and down the ballot. Um, you will see a lot of the races now. I think uh, one of the the best at it with, when you look at down ballot because there's 21 other folks in the race and that is Warnock um, and okay. where he has just been really pushing and saying, hey, I have a whole bunch of folks on the ballot. Don't forget me. I'm the I'm the <laughs> I'm second to the last one on the list, uh, making sure you go down ballot to find my name on the list. And so I think the more we try to get to make sure that folks don't just stop at the presidential candidates and that they actually go down ballot um, will indicate that a lot more. Um, we are, we're pushing to make sure on the Senate side that, the, that we flip those Senate seats um, and while we're protecting the seats that we have on the congressional side. So there are a lot of seats at play um, on the Senate level. You have, um, of course, Alabama, you got South Carolina, you have Texas, mm -hmm. you have Mississippi, um, you and then you have two in Georgia, and so um, it's we have a lot riding. You have a lot riding, and and also I think you have a lot riding on um, you know just local races as well. Yeah. We have a lot of DAs on the ballot. So when you talk about wanting to have something done and and really overturning situations that happened in Kentucky with um, uh, Breonna Taylor's situation. We need to make sure that those DAs, that people are really looking at DAs and judicial seats and making sure they're doing their homework and that for the first time we pay attention. I've heard everyone uh, for the first time in history talk about creating a voting plan. And that voting plan that everyone has been talking about, one of the main things that they've said, research the candidates. Go in with, your, with, with, the, with all of the candidates that you want to vote with, um, vote for already you've done your homework. Look at any ballot initiatives. There are ballot initiatives um, on, on the ballot here in Georgia, as well as around uh, across the country. And so we're just asking and begging folks to do your homework. If we want change in this country, it has to go from the top of the ballot to the bottom of the ballot. That is all of the candidates, all of the issues, but we need you more importantly to do your homework so that we can hold people accountable mm. once they're elected. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I think you're the person for this next question, which is a key one. When we talk about the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and please address both, in your professional opinion, how have they changed over the last two to four years? I mean, and I, there are some obvious things that stick out, but do you see the Democratic Party um, being more liberal than in previous years? Do you see the Republican Party, and obviously I'm talking about uh, the national sense, right? Do you see it being more conservative? What are your thoughts? Um, 
I'm gonna. I'm, I I don't see a lot of change when you look at the the party structure. Okay. Um, of of, of um, the Republicans are still conservative and and the Democrats are still liberal. I don't. I don't. I haven't really seen a big shift. Um, and the Republicans have done what they've always done. They stay true to their messaging, wrong or right. Um, you know, they've stayed true. Is that, is that, but let me ask you, that, is that an advantage in your professional opinion? I don't necessarily think that's an advantage. I think that's okay. actually during this time, it has hurt them tremendously. It, hurt, it has hurt their credibility mm -hmm. uh, because they have stayed true to something that everyone knows that, the, you know, things are not true. They've stayed true to statements that are blatantly and obvious that that is 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 not right for the country or even right for them as citizens, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't I don't necessarily think that has helped them. It has truly helped them to stay whatever the messaging was to stay on point um, in the past. But I think it has actually hurt them and hurt many of individuals on a local level, where because you know them personally, you could at least say, well, you know she's not 100% like that, or he's not 100% like that. But because of this lack of moving outside of whatever the national mantra is, it has hurt them, as a matter of fact, on a local level. I think for the Democrats, I think they have also stayed on message in a much different way. And that is looking at the, the, the issues at hand that have hurt and impacted our community and stayed on point with their messaging there. Um, again, I think um, for for the, the Democrats, they have been more concise and they have been more um, collaborative in the messaging. Um, the problem that you've seen in the past with the Democrats, you know, there's not there has been there hasn't been one message that that the party has stayed on. This time you see a little more a level of collaboration, um, a little more focus on the messaging and um, and where I think they have they're now building their credibility in the community when it looks at the messaging. I think the Democrats could have had stronger messaging and um, and really hit back a little more um, on some of the issues that have come out. But, you know, they have also taken the mantra of our first lady, when they go low, you stay high. So, hey, um, it is what it is. But I think again, we the messagings are there, the evidence <laughs> is there um, with all of the things that have happened in this country. And I just think, People are now at this point, they are fed up. They're going to make a decision. And I don't think we, any of us can persuade them, change them in this next 24 hours to do anything different. I think a lot of folks' minds are made up. If we can capture some of the young people in the process and making sure they actually get to the polls and vote if they haven't, that's going to be the huge help. But I think a lot of folks' minds are made up and we now just need to make sure they get to the polls and push the buttons and put the card in, whatever they're going to do, but they just need to vote. <laughs> Thank you for your feedback. Um, Monique, I want to go to you and I want to keep that question going because I know you're a political strategist. Most of your work has been with the Democratic Party. Um, do you see, obviously it was reported um, some time ago when uh, Senator Sanders um, was still a contender in the race. And obviously we know that um, Vice President Biden pulled away where we are now. Now he is the, the um, on the ticket for the Democratic Party. Um, do you see the Democratic Party based off your experience um, sort of at odds with itself in terms of tugging? I mean, it seems to be a united front um, to get Vice President Biden um, elected, but um, are there individuals, I'm assuming with influence within the party, within the movement, if you will, um, that are not satisfied with Biden, as you know, who has painted himself as more of a mainstream moderate candidate? Mm -hmm. So I think in both parties, there are the extremes. So, the, so there are the very conservative and then there are the moderate, right? And then on our side, there's the moderate and that moves over to the liberal, right? So mm -hmm. that's literally how we get the left and the right. <laughs> the left and, the right. and um, you have people in the middle and you have people on the spectrum. It's a spectrum for sure. Um, but at this moment in time, I do think the unity that you refer to in our party has much to do, uh, you know, in, in coming together for the sake of our country and coming together for the sake of our democracy and the health and safety of the people. And we see that we're in serious peril right now. We are. And so um, uh, the last time around, we didn't do so well in coming together. Um, there were, there were, um, there were factions at odds and obvious 
and there was no hiding that. But I do now everyone putting on the white coat and understanding that we have to save each other together. There's no individualism in this in this movement that we're trying to um, have that is going to effect, affect our country and create the effect of winning, right? So to win, we're better as a united front, right? We're like spaghetti, <laughs> dry spaghetti out here. So, um, you know, we cannot, we, we can't do it divided. Um, the left, the extreme left is not where we are right now and politics right now is not necessarily um even focused on the extreme left and socialist ideas right now politics is focused on getting us over this hump that we're that we're in and politics is focused on getting people back to a place where um you know the economy and when i say economy i'm not talking about the stock market i'm talking about working folks um managing their homes paying their bills um whether that be rent whether that be mortgage taking care of their kids buying food because we have food insecurity now mm -hmm. a lot right that has had a, a serious surge we've had a serious surge of food insecurity in america where we have a surplus of everything um so we want to get people over this hump. And to do that, we need somebody who's the polar opposite of Donald Trump. We need someone who's the polar opposite of the current leadership that we have. So we need someone who's going to be um, even keeled and, you know, seemingly full of humility and a person who, you know, and the reason the Democrats and the Democratic Party and this, the strategy keeps uh, keep uh, alluding to his grief that he's experienced and keep alluding to the loss he's experienced because this is a time of great grief in our country and this is a time of great loss and we need someone who is going to understand that so it really is an ethos effect it really is an ethos effort um, to appeal to everyone's emotions to make sure that uh, people who have suffered and can relate to suffering in this moment whether or not we have truly suffered um, over the length uh, of, of Donald Trump's tenure, um, at this moment, there is great suffering in the country. And it's in this moment that we have to choose who carries us for the next four years and what the future looks like, not just for the country, but what it's going to look like in my small apartment for me and my son, who is two years old, who will be in school by that time. Um, and for my mother, who is 64 and has diabetes and pre-existing conditions. And, and so this is what uh, people are thinking about. And so I'm very proud of the Democratic Party's effort to unite on to have a united front, at least, um, to get the vote out and to make sure people vote for whoever that candidate is. And I even think in choosing Kamala, who was one of Biden's harshest critics, um, before the primaries, um, I think in choosing Kamala, it's it's it was an effort to show that it's not just about him, it's not just about Joe Biden, it's about um, it's about varied ideas, it's about representation, and it's about uh, bringing us all together and bringing us all to the White House to make changes. Viewers, you are watching Let's Talk America Radio, a broadcast tonight. We have a special edition of Rural Talk. We're putting the spotlight on the upcoming election. We have a few minutes left, but we thank you for watching. If you're watching us on demand, uh, certainly sharing is caring um, to get awareness out. And we're talking about a very timely topic. Again, this general election, we'll be talking about 300 years from now. So uh, we certainly know there's been a lot of chatter about it. However you feel, one way or the other. I've got to ask you this, uh, Monique. Uh, the undecided. <laughs> Traditionally, all my life, when you're watching the news programs, there was always a group of undecided. As a political strategist, do you believe uh, there's anyone left in America right now? I mean, November the 3rd, we vote. Majority, um, well, there's so many that have voted already, right? But those will be casting their votes tomorrow. Do you think there are um, some, and I mean a practical some, not, you know, a few, um, who are undecided? Do you think America, for the most part, has made its mind up one way or the other? I think there are undecideds. I think there are. And even walking into tomorrow, I think there are. Because this weekend, we had a group of um, people leave New York, go to Pennsylvania to do door-to-door -door canvassing, and they met undecided voters, even as far as, far, uh, as, as, as late as yesterday, right? Um, but I think the interesting thing is in undecided voters really have gone largely unaffected 
by the Trump, um, the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something, that's something to think about. So um, what a lot of people have been doing is trying to use the ethos effort, use the, you, you know, apply, apply pressure on the emotion by showing and, and really highlighting the loss that um, their neighbors have faced, that they haven't faced, that they can't relate to. It's really for a lot of voters and for most voters, it's a matter of relatability and it's a matter of understanding and connection. Okay. And there are some people who, um, like I said, have gone largely unaffected. They didn't get a pay raise under Trump and they didn't lose their jobs under Trump. They didn't, uh, you know, they went home and they are frustrated with the lockdown, but they're, they also didn't lose anybody during COVID. So, you know, there, uh, there are people, there are people, they're the unicorn. <laughs> of, the, of the world right now but there but are people. let me let me ask you this and 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 I, I think you make a very practical point and, and you're a strategist I'm not but even for those you're right who's saying well, economically maybe things did not change for them um but my question is when we talk about the president of the United States and however people feel about him um he seems to be an individual where people have very strong opinions one way or the other. For those that you're saying that are undecided and maybe they're thinking of economics, maybe they're thinking of other things, but does personality of the, the public figure come into play any as, as far as you're concerned? Absolutely. But also they go largely unaffected. There are people who either agree with Trump, mm -hmm. um, things he says and uh, um, the, rhetoric, the rhetoric he uses. And there are people who take serious offense to that, to the things he says and the things he does and the things he alludes to. But then there are people who thought of it no way, you know, neither left nor right. They thought nothing wrong with what he said, even though they may not necessarily agree or it's not something they would have said. Um, there are those people and it's hard to believe because Generally, when you run into someone, um, you know, you, they think of the, the, you can you can discuss whether or not you agree with a point. Right. Um, and people may or may not agree with points that Trump's made that um, Trump has made, but they don't necessarily um, feel affected by it when there are things that Trump has said, even in his campaign, that has personally affected me. That I took personal okay. offense because I there it, it has a negative connotation to a group I am in or a category I that I um as a woman as a black person and there's intersectionality that as a black woman um I feel a, a certain way but there are people who don't fall into these categories so um, by and large some of the things he says you know goes you know, you know it flies over their okay. head. And because they don't, they um they don't belong to the group of people that he's talking to, and so that sensitivity, that's the word I should have used sooner. That sensitivity is not there, um, and there are people who, and people would say that it's a dog whistle, and there are people who hear that dog whistle and you know are very um, activated by that and inspired mm. and charged by that. Mm. So there there are extremes, and there's the middle. You know, and thank you so much, Monique. David, and I want to ask this of you. Obviously, you're a professor of marketing. You know a lot about marketing online, the traditional sense of it. But what Monique described, um, obviously, there was a personal identification she's talking about, regardless of who we're talking about, what public figures or certain campaign messaging. But I want to bring up the E word of empathy. Right. So I may not be a group of individuals impacted by this, but I would like to believe. Right. And, and that's the power to me of journalism that through the, the real life storytelling of journalism and news, I can somehow connect that if someone is being cruel or mean to people that wear a red sweater, like what Rhonda has on, that I can say, wait a minute, that 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 and maybe I don't have a red sweater on, but there are values that I hold dear that that's not right if someone's bullying someone with a red sweater, right? And by the way, Rhonda, I love your red sweater. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> but David, when it comes to online activity or even marketing in the sense of a television or a billboard, it, it, are people more apt to drive by that billboard if the messaging is a small child and saying, hey, you should get your kids back to school. I'm just using that as an example. 
as a mother, that would resonate to me. But if you're not a father, or, or do we know the psychology of it from marketing? Are you less likely to tune in? Or I would like to thank you say, but if I'm a father or not, I was a kid once. I have a relationship with my mother. I, I can identify. I have a sister that has children. What's realistic when it comes to majority of people? Do we know the psychology of marketing? I mean, we know, we know a fair amount about kind of th this idea of in-group versus out-group. Okay. That the things that, the groups that I identify with, you know, if I think about how I construct, you know, my identity. So I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm an Emory employee, I live in Atlanta. You know, those salient characteristics, you know, the, the ones that are activated on a regular basis for people, if you can kind of latch on to one of those themes, that's what's most likely going to resonate with someone. And it's how strongly do they form that identity? Because yeah, if they have a very you know, strongly forged identity, it's saying, okay, this is my in-group. This is the group that I belong to um, versus everyone else. And so that's where there's the need to kind of you know, to, to um, play to those particular themes where someone else who may not as strongly identify with a uh, with their particular group, they may be more open minded in terms of the types of mess the types of messages that are going to appeal to them. Mm. I, I have to ask you this, and this is fair, and I think as someone that knows marketing and advertising would know this. Is any of that based off of education level? And, and I and I have to ask that because so much is right. We do know, and and, and people like it or not, but when people are more educated, they tend to do more behavior. Is empathy somehow tied to education levels? Do we know? I'm not aware of you know research that has looked at the link between empathy and education level. You know, uh, certainly education level tends to be linked with uh, po uh, political leanings. That's something that has been uh, fairly well documented yeah. already. You know, the divide between um, college educated and not is something that's come up 2016. It's come up in this election cycle as well, as far as how that vote is going to um, break for the two main candidates. But as far as educating on empathy, mm -hmm. certainly there are things that we can do to improve that you know, uh, EQ, um, if you will. Um, but I don't know if it's going to correlate with, with schooling. Okay. Okay. Um, and I have to ask you this, of course, being a social media expert, uh, we know four years ago, there was a lot of chatter. There was a lot of news coverage in terms of foreign influence on social media dealing with the presidential campaign. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if there was a connection with some other races of senatorial or local. I had not have heard that. And you may know more about that than I do. Um, but in terms of this go round, I haven't really heard it as much. I did see a big story about Iran um, and Russia, but it didn't seem to really go viral as much. Do you think or have evidence that there is proof again that here we go? Because last four years, it was Russia. You know, there's an investigation. Um, there were some mixed results of what came out of that. There are people that have doubted what the official results were. Um, is Russia doing it again? And, and Iran, is, is this something new or was that around before? I think that's something that we're going to be, have to contend with going forward. You know, I think 2016, we saw it. I think there's less talk about it this time around. Right. Uh, the social media platforms have been a bit more vigilant okay. um, in, in terms of monitoring it. And I give them credit for trying to get it under control, uh, but it's like a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, you know, the people kind of trying to do the policing on, on behalf of the social media platforms, mm -hmm. uh, very good in terms of trying to find what's going on and what are the signals that we can actually rely on to say this is an illegitimate use of our platform well what does the other side do says okay well we're going to do something different that we haven't done before so we can try to get that through as undetected uh, so that's going to be something that's constantly on the radar and i would generalize it a bit more beyond just foreign interference just the way in which social media is trying to be used to manipulate opinions uh we've seen things like um the great hack on on netflix i think the new one is the social dilemma we've seen a lot of documentaries talking about the way in which social media was essentially weaponized as information warfare and that's not all coming from overseas a lot of that's being done by the campaigns uh, Oh, themselves okay right? you know, 
you know, that that that's not something that has to be coming from um, a foreign government. It's trying to figure out what makes people tick, what's going to get them to show up or not show up. Yeah. Um, you know, can we unify people versus divide people? Can we play on what motivates them or what demotivates them? And so I would be keeping an eye on that from, you know, really from all sources. You know, the yeah. idea of legitimate social media accounts versus bots, um, always something that's going to be with us. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. And I will say misinformation as much. I mean, there are reasonable, educated people that are repeating things they saw online. Um, and so it's got to be true. And uh, some of these things seem planted. And you're right. I mean, I think we can thank foreign influence, but you're saying that some of this may not be someone in another country sitting in a room doing this. You're saying there's a possibility someone affiliated or someone not affiliated with a supporter of one of the major candidates doing it on their behalf, thinking they're helping um, that because when it came to Russia before, um, and just you know, general information, when I was told that basically there were bot pages or pages not legitimate that were set up targeting, and I heard African American voters mm -hmm. in terms of putting information out that was not verified or legitimate, but it was to spark emotions. Is that right? Right. Yeah, they're, they're, so yeah, the inf the way that with information we used it was to target specific groups to either not get them to show up uh, to okay, to right. vote to kind of demotivate them, or to create discord. Uh, and if we think about the just the sheer range of news sources that are out there, and I use the term news very loosely, um, you know, we have kind of our respected news outlets, and then we have some that peddle conspiracy theories. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and those news sources, they attract an audience. And so that information gets ingested, gets um, recycled through the echo chamber. And all of a sudden, people are coming to rely on that information. Uh, a yeah. report from uh, the Pew Center came out, this was a couple of years ago, saying that for I think the majority of people now rely on social media as their news source. And there's a big difference between saying, I see a headline on social media, I click on it and I go to the original source and I can see here's the byline for the That's reporter, right. here's the outlet that it came from, this is coming from a source that has credibility to me versus just seeing a headline on social media and taking that at face value. Yeah. yeah. That's so key. And, and I will say one of the yeah, things. So I think the lesson in all of this is social media is going to be with us. It's not going anywhere. Um, we can't just take that information at face value. We've got to dig into it a little bit and really know where, know what the facts are, know where this information is coming from. Right. Yeah, that's so key. Check the source. And also I'm going to say the dates because I, <laughs> I, I have friends and associates and colleagues that are sharing things that is from 70 years ago. And, and, and that's important, just the timeliness of the news. And if it's even real, not something new um, that may not be new. Rhonda, I, I wanna ask you this. I wanna stay on misinformation because David brought up a great point. They were targeting certain groups. Um, I know, and you know, um, when it comes to conspiracy theories at C-Word, um, that both individuals that may be affiliated or supporters of both of these major parties um, we'll sort of tote and promote these. Um, you know, obviously there were some who doubted that the commander in chief did not have COVID. I, I saw that um, from one side mostly. Um, and then I've seen the other side, you know, things that seem to be like, well, what is that based off of? Uh, as an advocate in the community, as an attorney, are you concerned um, about, and I wanna say one, misinformation, but also, Maybe information is just not verified that people are sort of latching on to. Are you concerned about that? And, and how much of emotions is being put into that when we're not really thinking it clear and thinking it through? Um, times, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, um, you know, I, I think um, David said it, most people read and believe whatever's on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and we have to just teach folks to verify, 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 you know, in many of these conversations I've been having, many of our trainings we've been having, we've been telling folks to make sure that they're, they themselves are not putting out this um, information, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about polling locations, especially when we're talking about voting and getting to the polls and all of that. We need to make sure, especially on tomorrow, that people have good, accurate information. 
that they have um, really good accurate information. I was talking to someone over the weekend and they were out telling folks, you know, that they could still go to an to a, a early voting location on tomorrow to vote. And I'm like, no, that was just for early voting. You have to go to your community and neighborhood precinct mm -hmm. on Tuesday. You cannot go to any location to vote. And so you're absolutely correct. We need to make sure that people have good, solid, verifiable information at all times and that you check, double check and recheck all of the information that people are giving you because we need to make sure that the right information is out there and being um, provided to folks. Yeah, so, so important. You brought up tomorrow, I, I wanna go there as you begin to close up. Um, is it realistic that America will have a definitive answer tomorrow on who the next commander in chief will be come January of 2021? Unfortunately, Shana, I doubt it. Hmm. Um, you know, we have a lot of issues going on right now. Um, you know, um, Texas, they were just fighting over a couple of hundred thousand um, votes, um, you know, being counted or thrown out. Um, I saw in Miami, someone sent me a video of a post office that was filled to capacity with absentee ballots and how the district attorney is sending folks in to go to the different um, post offices to make sure that absentee ballots are not there in bins and that they actually have made it to the registrar's office because mm -hmm. the folks took them to the, the post office and no one took them to where they needed to go for their final destination. And mm -hmm. so I think there's gonna be so many lawsuits. Um, I also think that um, a lot of states probably didn't hire enough folks to do the voting. I mean, the counting of the ballots, um, you know, there's a certain time where they can open up on, on tomorrow evening once the polls close and start their counting. And so that's probably going to take some, some time, especially when you have record numbers of absentee ballots coming in. You have overseas ballots from all your military and, and those folks who live abroad. And then you have the, the early votes and then you have the votes that are taken on that day. So there's a, a combination of things that, that we are going to have to figure out. Um, you're gonna have, there's several um, in, in these elections and you talked about the Senate races and all yeah. of that, um, you know, folks are gonna contest and fight those if they come really close. And so, and, and you have runoffs. We're gonna have, we yeah. got several runoffs that's gonna happen in Georgia, right? Yeah. So yeah. we, we, have a, we, we have a lot of moving pieces and um, with election protection, I just think there's going to be a lot of confusion and all sorts of things. And people are already geared up. Attorneys are waiting um, to file lawsuits and they're going to be ready to go. So I just think with all of these, the issues that we currently have and the ones that we don't even know that we're going to have on tomorrow, it's probably going to be a long time um, and a lot of fighting before we get to the final decision of who is the new president of these United States and in many of those seats in which is on, on that are on the ballot. So, and so um, let's hopefully- talk America, Rhonda, you know, is about real talk for real people. And you explained that so eloquently and well. Mm -hmm. Translate that for us in terms of, and, and I know as an attorney at law, you know, you're saying attorneys mm -hmm. are geared up and, and, and you're saying there's certainly a possibility this could be in the courts for a while, but the pulse of the people, you know this, most of us are not attorneys like you or experts like David and, and Monique. I, and, and, I, and I'm gonna say this, um, and if there was a psychiatrist on the show, a psychologist, they'd be able to vouch for this, but the people seem to be anxious one way or the other. If you wanna change in the White House, if you're content and, you're, and you support who's in that White House, they seem to want that answer immediately. If it doesn't come, and, and obviously I, most reasonable people want uh, things to be peaceful and fine, but is there, as a community advocate who's worked, you've seen political scenes so many times, do you have a professional and personal concern that there could be discord in the streets if things are not figured out within a timely frame for Americans? I, I mean, I think, I think um, 
everyone is gearing up. I mean, unfortunately, I, mean, I don't know what the, the outcome of the how people are going to respond. I mean, we're hearing already um, that being in play, regardless if the, 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 the dust has settled and you know the, the winner. I mean, either way, I think there are so many people that are going to be upset, even outside of them not knowing with, with Take, take the voting of these ballots and everything, take that out of the mix. Um, just off on the sentiment of, of what we're hearing in communities, I mean, people are telling folks to be careful. Um, there are, um, you know, different folks that are really going to be upset, I think, either way. Um, and so I just think to, on tomorrow, people need to just be very cautious um, of knowing that there's a lot of unrest um, brewing right now. Um, that is way outside of what what I'm talking about, um, Shana, which is you know understanding the final outcome of the election. Now, will we know some things that are going on? Yes, absolutely. Okay. On tomorrow, um, will will based on the information coming in, um, you know, um, um, with 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 the ballots that are there, you know, hopefully, um, you know, they'll tell us, you know, who's who's in the lead and all of that. But I, I just think the formality of the process, right? The yeah. final formality of the process is what's going to linger a little. Um, and that could be a, a couple of days. I don't know. I just know if things are not going to go well on um, tomorrow, that people will be geared up to fight. I know that um, if we don't have the final numbers, they will probably come in the next couple of days or so. Um, but at the same time, we just need to be set that there, we, with the with an understanding of the possibilities, with all of the different combination of things, that there might be issues and problems. And if that's the case, people are are re really ready to make sure that they bring things to a resolve, that that they're not going to um, let a lot of things go that they probably would have let go in the past. And people are prepared legally to make sure that every vote is counted. Mm. And I think that's so important that every vote is counted and, and prayerfully that will be done um, in the most uh, effective and peaceful way. Um, Monique, for you as a political strategist, um, as someone obviously who wants to see the best in people throughout communities, um, what is the message you would hope um, for everyone who lives in the United States of America outside to understand right now, regardless of what happens tomorrow, um, what would you want to see of us that defines the humanity of this nation? What we're hoping to see um, as it pertains to our humanity, as it pertains to our country's democracy, is that, um, is that we have integrity. Okay message we want to see. We have integrity and integrity is deep and integrity runs wide and integrity um, breaks barriers and uh, it's transient, right? It, it, it can go from one place to the next um, despite who you are, where you're from, where you're going, where you've been. So we want to see integrity stand and we want to see integrity win tomorrow and um, that's the strongest message and integrity for different people mean different things yeah. but but there come the very basis of it the very foundation of integrity is um is a foundation of understanding and a foundation of connection and a foundation of peace and oh. that's that's what we want we definitely have seen that um, some of the things that we're all anxious about, some of the things that some people are scared for, as Rhonda was describing, and the things that people are concerned for, um, it definitely didn't come from out of nowhere. Much of it is incited, right? Much of it uh, has been incited through um, useful and effective rhetoric and useful, mm -hmm. effective messaging and um, repetitiveness, right? Um, and you have, you have, uh, uh, good people who if they're told something enough and if they're told that something of theirs is threatened and that their lives and livelihood are threatened they will uh, be on the offensive and that might have um, unexpected parties on the defensive um, and so I think um, 
as much as we would like to um, villainize some people who are overreacting right now, they don't necessarily know that. They do strongly believe because they've been told so often every day in and out um, from where they get their information that um, their lives are being threatened. There is a threat here against them. And so they're reacting and they think in protection of themselves um, when others who have different sources of information and um, varying sources of information um, others you, you know it's easy for us to judge their behavior um without fully understanding that some of it is incited and people in positions of power and people with an audience know the effect they have um when they whisper violence and when they whisper and incite um negativity and when they give you a target so um our hope is that this won't win tomorrow. Our hope is that that um, ideology, that behavior, that philosophy will be trumped out. Mm -hmm. um, everyone on this panel are parents. As our children watch tomorrow, and there are a lot of predictions that have been made Monique, um, but there were predictions made in 2016, right? And there was some shock that took place and there was electoral college at play and that did not match up with the popular vote. Um, but win or lose, David, win or lose on social media and people will express their emotions on social media, either way. And as Rhonda pointed out, even if we're still waiting on early Wednesday morning or Friday night, they're going to go to social media one way or the other, some people, millions, to express themselves. As a parent, as a human being, as, as a professional, do you see that concerning in terms of what we're showing our kids? Because win or lose, we're taught, at least this generation, well, our generation, if you will, to move forward and pick up yourself and, and keep going. But there could be some individuals who may see it different, right? Um, what is that saying about our behavior in terms of accepting um, results? And, and I do wanna add, but there could be people that truly believe those results are not legitimate. I, and that would cause another emotion, I have to acknowledge that. Um, but when they're saying, I refuse to believe my candidate lost, that didn't happen. Um, we've seen that in some other topics, right? I, I don't wanna face this. So I'm going to pretend it all went away and I keep moving on with my life, right? Without a mask, without washing in, because I, I was tired of it and I'm ready to go. I think it goes back to the psychology of it, but it's tied to marketing because it's people's behavior in terms of how they accept things. And as you know, marketers, business, nonprofit, and politicians try to incite, using Monique's terminology, they try to incite that to get the result they want. What do you say about tomorrow night, as Rhonda pointed out, or Wednesday morning, if we don't have those results one way or the other? Yeah, I think, you know, the social media platforms, again, trying to limit things until we actually have um, the fi the final results. I, I think you're going to see a lot of back and forth. Um, unfortunately, I, I would anticipate a lot of uh, more inflammatory comments that, than we might like. Uh, you know, hopefully, yeah, when this is all said and done, you know, it, we're one country, right? And, you know, we, we've become more partisan over the last four, four plus years. Uh, but at some point we've got to start acting like, like one country. Uh, I don't know if social media is gonna help us with that, at least in the immediate aftermath of this election. Yeah, I, I was gonna say there are a lot of perks to social media. I think most people can acknowledge that, but there are some sad parts, disturbing parts. Um, as well to social media. Um, and I've heard some experts say they think it's added to the, uh, the division, the discord in the country as well. But, but I, I keep going back, David, I keep bringing this up, Rhonda. Is social media a reflection of it? Which way is it? Because at the end of the day, and my dad says this, and he's no fan of social media, um, but did Facebook create the sin 
or the sinners created the sin that's on it? And, and that's a valid question because we can blame social media, but Facebook isn't forcing your hand to do anything, right? It's not forcing you to go in any inbox, any inflammatory statement. It's none of that. And are we unfairly really pointing the fingers at Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook when it's really us as human beings? That's, I have always been behind it. Yeah, at the, at the end of the day, it's the people. And so, you know, one of the things that these platforms have provided is a means of making it easier for, for like-minded people to find each other and to you know, see the content that kind of reinforces the view that you have, whether grounded in fact or not. Mm. Uh, you know, there, there's a question of um, should the social media and more broadly should digital companies be immune from or be uh be held responsible for the content posted on their platforms uh the president has spoken about removing um so, some of the immunity that they that they currently enjoy be, for claiming that they're biased uh but it's a it's a fair question to say you know, if this is where people are getting their news if social media platforms have become the new purveyors of news should we be holding them responsible for the content on their platform that's a good point. Yeah, that, that's a, a great point. And not to mention um, all of the news outlets also stream and use yep. Facebook, Twitter, I, I mean, Instagram. They certainly do because they realize obviously there are billions on it. And that's how you reach your people um, that you're trying to um, really connect with. Great conversation, David. Rhonda, I'm going to close our official question with you. And it's one that needs to be said. We're going to put it out there. Real talk for real people. 20 years from now, we'll all be older. <laughs> My gray hair will be in more. Um, we may or may not look the same, but how will that generation, that time, define where we are, regardless of what happens tomorrow night or as you predict weeks from now, whenever, in this moment in time, through the campaigning David talked about on social media, of Monique saying there are people being excited for the behavior and they're not realizing it, you realizing that things can shift one way or the other politically um, on a spectrum. How will this moment in time, in November 2020, be seen through the eyes of history? Because it's something I deeply consider with everything. Sometimes I wonder if enough people are thinking of that, right? Because we're living in the moment, we're getting our point across, we're gonna do this, we're gonna vote for that. But we, I love history, I'm a history junkie. So when I think back, in, in the scope of it, the leaders before around the globe of some realizing, some not, some were very savvy to realize how history would judge them, right? You see examples of those who were savvier than others who got that, it was more than the moment. Where do you think history will judge us, all of us? Because we're one way or the other, beside what spectrum? How will we be judged? How will we be written about? Well, that that is, um, I, I think, um, that's one of the reasons why you're seeing the response from, 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 from everyone this election cycle. You know, Obama had, um, Biden-Harris um, campaign has this tagline says um, that we're in the battle for the souls of the nation. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it is the battle of the soul of the nation, right? And so we understand that everything's on the ballot right now. Mm -hmm. You know, systematic racism is on the ballot. Um, voter suppression is on the ballot. Um, police brutality and police violence is on the ballot. Um, access to health care is on the ballot. This pandemic is on the ballot. Our very lives are on the ballot right now. And so I think um, that, that, that mantra with all of the civil unrest and everything that we've seen in 2020, um, we understand that all of that stuff is on the ballot. And, and we will be judged about how we have responded to these issues in this country. We will be judged in how we move forward with maintaining and sustaining our lifestyle and how do we return back post COVID. Um, and all of that is on this ballot. And so it, it, it is going to be a time where um, accountability, um, where the decisions are being made, Will, will resonate and, and really mark, as you said, our place in history forever. And so I think people are very clear um, that all of that stuff is on the ballot, that we have to be serious 
about how we make these decisions because those decisions being made will impact us for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I just think that um, we will be moving and exploring um, a new way of living. I don't know if we'll ever return 100% back to where we once were in this country. Okay. Wow. And so now when you look at where we need to go, all of those decisions and that pressure um, is on the ballot. And we have to make some serious decisions tomorrow. Are we going to live and continue to fight? Or we are, are we going to roll over and more people die? Because we've had more people die senselessly in 2020 and we cannot lose another life. We can't lose another life to police brutality, COVID or anything else in this country because life is so precious. And those in our, that generation is watching us and they will judge us by the decisions that we make. Mm, absolutely, great answer. As we have judged previous generations as well, right? I mean, if they're black and white documentaries, if they're in color documentaries, um, our time will come as well to be judged of who we are. And, and it always has an impact on the world because after all, it's not just what happens to us, but around the world, so global. I thank both of you again, Professor uh, Davis Waddell with uh, Emory University, Professor of Marketing. Thank you for being on with us. Rhonda Briggins, attorney at law and also community advocate. Uh, she's worked um, in many, many um, campaigns and initiatives throughout the country. And we had uh, Monique Charlton on with us, a longtime political strategist out of New York City as well. We thank all of you. Um, wherever you fall on the political spectrum, and that is certainly your right, your voice, your opinion, I encourage you to make sure you cast your vote. If you're one of the millions, or like myself, you've already had, we will be watching closely, intensely tomorrow if you have not make a plan to vote, however you're gonna do that on November the 3rd. And as a nation, as a community, as a global environmental world, we all will be watching what will happen in the United States. And uh, hopefully we'll have a result soon. I know there are experts on this panel, not necessarily convinced of that, but whoever we are, may we show um, the character that we would be proud of. And as attorney at law, Rhonda Bergen said that when history looks back and it judges us and we'll call it as it is when the, all the rose glasses are taken off and the momentary gain that so many people focus on when it's all said and done, who we are um, matters. And our children and our grandchildren will look back at this time as well. I thank all of you for watching. Stay connected to Let's Talk America Radio. We deliver real talk for real people. And that's you, the issues that matter to you, the general election. This is your show. It's the people show. Stay with us. Sharing is caring. Share this episode. Let your kids watch it, your grandkids, your nieces and nephews. Let them know exactly how important this election is and where it all will fall in the history of time. And as you can see, my, my young one <laughs> listening behind me as well. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for watching. Stay connected. For more information on Let's Talk America Radio, visit ltaradio.com. Use the hashtag LTA Radio and connect with us. More episodes coming your way, more experts coming your way. Tonight was phenomenal, the best of the best. Thank you, David. Thank you, Rhonda. Monique, thank you so much, everyone. Stay well and stay safe. Good night. Good night. Bye. Vote.